As you're being seated, you might take your Bibles to the book of Revelation this evening, Revelation chapter number 8. I feel like it's been forever since we've been in the book of Revelations. I'm listening. I have a pastor friend of mine in, in uh, Baltimore. He's going through Revelation. He started just if, uh, probably a couple months ago. Well, wow, it's we did. He's in chapter 20. So I guess I really need to speed up a little bit. I was surprised. I said, what are you doing, a book at a time? I don't know how he was getting so fast. But Revelation, I'm in the wrong book. Psalms is not the right book. Revelation chapter 8 tonight. Revelation chapter 8. Uh, we're going to be re- reading in verse number 5 to the end of the chapter uh, let's actually just read the first couple verses of Revelation chapter 8, starting in verse 5. And the angel took the uh, censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for the privilege you've given to us to worship you tonight. Lord, to think about... Our God seated on his throne, Lord, as we've seen depicted in this book. And the awesomeness of thinking who has held the oceans in his hand, all that you've done, and that you would call us filthy, rotten sinners, you would call us a friend. Father, may we take our needs, our desires, and our concerns to you because you are in control. Well, Father, tonight, as we take a few minutes and we evaluate a little more about what's to come in our world history. I pray, Father, that we do more than just listen to the Bible or just learn some things, but Lord, that it would have an impact in our lives. I pray, Father, you speak to our hearts tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last weekend, uh, we had taken our daughter down to Pensacola, and I've been watching. I never, until the last two years, I never really ever considered any hurricane sent coming to the Gulf, personally. Never paid attention to it. Last year, my son was down there, and a hurricane came right over Pensacola. I was talking to a friend of mine that lives in Pensacola this last weekend, and he says, crazy, the eye of the storm got over us and then just sat there for 24 hours and didn't move. He said, they haven't even totally cleaned up the whole area from it yet. So this year, we're down there, and we had, uh, we'd flown down Southwest Airlines. Uh, I did, I, I, it was actually the cheapest rate, and we could get free luggage. And since we're taking a girl to college, free luggage is worth its weight in gold, to be honest with you. So we get down there, and I've learned that you can change your fare, change your flights for free, unless it's more expensive at Southwest. And so we're watching as the storm's getting closer and closer and closer to Louisiana. But they were talking about the effects. We thought about going to the shore. They said, don't even go to the beach. You can't go on it because of the swells. And so we're down there. And Sunday morning, we go to church. And we're pulling on the property. My daughter's walking from the dorm room. We're we're getting ready to find her. And the rain was coming. You couldn't see anything. It was crazy. And I told her, this is why we don't live in the south. That's relatively normal. But I couldn't get over the amount of rain. The girl, the, the dorm, the students had been told, go home. Stay in your dorm. It's raining. All right, you can come back to church. Nope, 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 stay in the dorms. Stay stay there. All right, right, you can come to church. And they finally got in there, and most of them were soaked. Even with an umbrella. An umbrella does you no good when the rain's coming this way. It just doesn't do you any good. And so uh, she gets in there, and we go go to church. And while I'm sitting in church, we decided we got to get away from here early. So we were supposed to fly Monday, and I went to this app of Southwest, and I moved my flight to Sunday. I thought, we got this, right? We are smarter than the storm. And while I'm sitting there at about well, 11, 10, 10 o'clock, their church service started at 10, so about 11 o'clock our time here, uh, I get a text and I pull my phone out, your flight's been canceled. It wasn't like it may be delayed. You know, the storm's coming. It's, it's canceled. Don't even come to the airport, loser. That's what it felt like, right? There's not even an option here. Am I canceled? The storm's not coming until tonight. I learned later the guest speaker that started speaking the night at Pensacola flew in Sunday afternoon. I'm going to call Southwest and complain, all right? So I moved it to Monday. I don't know why I thought moving it deeper into the heart of the storm was going to solve the problem. So I, we get back to this Airbnb we'd rented, and I called them up. Well, I called Ted Southwest, called me back, and they called me back, and I'm like, so what about getting out tomorrow? Ladies, yes, sir, I can't promise you anything. But they've already canceled all the flights for tomorrow. I'm like, oh, how about Tuesday? She said, sir, I can promise you you'll be out by Thursday. She said, I really don't know when they're opening up the airport, but it depends on how long, you know, the hurricane stays in the area. I'm like, oh, what are my options? 
She goes, I don't know, rent a car, get a hotel, hang out. I don't know. She goes, I'm not your travel advisor. That's what she told me. I'm not your travel advisor. I can't get you home. The rest of it's in your hands. And I'm like, I'm not sure whether to be offended by this or what. So we're sitting there and it just hit me. I wonder. So I, we went on and what would it cost to rent a car from Pensacola to Georgia and just drop the car off. So we did. We drove up to Georgia and then I'm watching the news. And you know where the storm was supposed to go next? Georgia. Well, then we changed the flight. We flew out of Georgia, which took us through Chicago Midway. Guess where the storm was supposed to go next? Chicago. And I looked at her. I'm like, I am flying to Canada. So the storm just keep following me out of here, right? So we get home and I thought, man, we're done. We are done, and we're done with this hurricane. No big deal, no problem. And then I'm home, and I'm enjoying it, and then my phone starts yelling at me, tornado warning. I'm like, I live in the Delaware Valley. We don't have tornadoes out here. And then tornado emergency. And I'm like, what is that? Is that like for the dummies who haven't hidden yet? Go do it now? And so I, we're looking around, and then I and then of course saw a video of tornadoes in my general vicinity. I live probably what three miles from the Burlington Bristol Bridge, and there's a tornado right on the other side of it. And my favorite part was I was watching the guy who filmed the video. He's watching the tornado, and as the tornado's passing, he begins to take off again. And I'm like, no, 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 sit still. I mean, it's over. The video's done. Sit still. But I'm watching, and I'm remembering what happened around here. And you know, with all these storms increasing. As I was reading all the different articles, there was one that caught my attention. And it was an article that was from the New York City mayor. And they're always the smartest people in the world, all right? But I think his name is Bill de Blasio, if I'm not mistaken, all right? And he, he had to tell you, he came up and he, he said, we are now in the other world. And I'm like, is he on something, the other world? What's he talking about? So I read a little bit. He said, for years, we have been warned about the results of global warming and climate change. It's going to destroy our world. Look at these storms. We're there. And I thought, oh. Now, my first reaction is the politics behind it and everything. And I didn't read a whole lot of it. I just caught that bit of the article because I don't want to read the rest of it. Anyway, as, I'm, as I read that part, you know, the first thought goes through my mind is the politics and the annoyance of it. But then for a second, I just stopped and I thought about something. So for most of us, when we look at the, church, the natural disasters that we're going to read about in a little bit that are coming to the world, they're coming in the tribulation time. If we have Jesus, how many of you are worried about these disasters for you? We're not, right? We're not going to be here. So I'm not overly concerned. When we flew out, when we drove away from Florida... I thought, we're away from this hurricane. We're away from the tornado. And we're driving. Now, you have to remember, we had to drive through Alabama to get to Georgia. You know what Alabama is? A magnet for tornadoes. My, my, I'm telling you, I've been down there a few times. i got friends from there. They are like in the middle of tornado row. So we're driving up one of the highways, and our phone goes off, tornado warning. Now, we're in Alabama, so we're watching. We're watching for a tornado. I mean, it was like, you got to be kidding me. Now, once I got through it, I didn't care anymore. We're sitting in Chicago beautiful blue skies. I didn't think about the storm. But I think about people like Bill de Blasio. Here's a couple things that go through my mind. When these natural disasters that we're going to read in a second come, somebody's going to have to have an explanation for them, right? So when I listen, you know, I hear him. Here's what I'm saying. I don't know de Blasio's opinion of Christianity. I know he's not a fan of it, but I don't know his religious point of view. But obviously, he doesn't claim Christianity. So if he doesn't, how else is he going to explain what's going on in our world? We know it. I believe. And you say, do you believe in climate change? Yes. God is claiming the ch claim, changing the climate to prepare for the tribulation. He's been doing it since the day he built the earth. He's preparing for this. Do I think we're causing it? We won't get into all of that. But no, I do think it's changing. There is some change. As God begins to prepare us for what we're about to read. These natural disasters coming. And there are, there are going to be politicians who have to give an answer. So when I read, I thought, you know, we laugh at this. But frankly, if we had no hope of being away from it, this would be a tad bit frightening. I pictured us standing by our house waiting for a tornado to come down. To be honest with you, I never told my kids, we're talking about where should we go? Should we go to this tub? Should we go to this closet? Should we do this? Should we do this? And I'm sitting there thinking, the fact is, if a tornado drops down on a Levittown or without a basement, there's really nowhere to go. I didn't tell my kids this, all right, because I was too afraid to tell my kids this, all right? I was going to go to my, help me. I wasn't going to do that. So I'm standing by the window just like, Lord, what are you going to do? Just waiting to see something. Nothing happened, obviously, in Aria. But 
It's easy for us to be consumed when it affects us, and it's easy for us to become someone indifferent when it doesn't, when it's not a threat to us. Now, I think about that when I think about the passage we're going to look at. Let me ask you a question. This is the, 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 there's always truth. You know, we listen to even teaching and preaching the Word of God. We get a lot of facts, but if those facts don't compel any kind of thinking, then they're empty, and God's Word does not return void. I want you to consider something with me. For most of my life, for all my life and generations before us, since the day of Apostle Paul, when he penned many of these, every generation has expected to be the generation that was going to be here when Jesus came back, right? The disciples looked for it. People after that. The church has looked for it for years. My grandparents, my great-grandparents, my dad grew up and the thinking in many of the years was don't retire because God's going to come. Don't worry about retirement. God's going to come back. And in fact, I heard one preacher years ago say this, run up your credit card debt. When God comes back, give it to the government. And then God didn't come back. And he had all his credit card debt, right? Not wasn't great preaching, to be honest with you. Now, here's my point. For years, everybody's desired to be that generation that was going to be there when God came. Is it possible that we are that generation? You look at this. I look at what's happening in the world getting more and more prepared. With, I mean, the, the excessiveness of the natural disasters in our world with fires and everything is increasing. Now, God may wait a thousand more years, but let, let me, have you thought about this? Have you thought about the awesomeness and, dare I say, the responsibility of being the generation that God takes home in the rapture? The generation he's talked about all the way through Scripture to be that group. Not only the awesomeness of saying, it was me, I was in it, cool. Not only that, but we're the last ones that God has left here potentially to tell the world about him. When we read what we're going to read in a little bit, talking about the natural disaster is going to come. Yes, we're not going to be here. If you've been saved, you're not going to be here. But would it compel us to think about the fact that the people we walk by and we know will be? They don't have to be. May these things compel us tonight as we evaluate a couple of things about the, about the revelation about these things tonight. Now, most of us love the thinking of old, of end times, right? I, it, to me, it cracks me up. How many people love zombies? They love the whole zombie movie, like zombie apocalypse. Years ago, somebody walked into my office. If you've never been in my office, some people, they don't, really don't know how to take it in the first two minutes of my, when they walk in. They walk in, I've got some bookshelves, a desk, I've got some eagle figurines, and they walk around the corner, and I've got a wall full of swords. And people come in, what are you going to do with those? I don't even know what to do with that question, to be honest with you. Nothing. I'm going to do nothing with them. They're going to hang on that wall because they're awesome, all right? I'm not going to do anything with them. Except for a zaki, I don't know where that zombie apocalypse came from, right, James? We got this, right? A zombie apocalypse, because I understand taking their heads off the only way to win. So I've got this covered. I don't believe zombies are coming, by the way. Okay, <laughs> all right. Now, but we love watching those end of the world things, and where you know some tragedy happens, and when this tragedy happens, you know this is what the world's going to be like. There's one we watched. I don't remember which one it was. We're not watching the zombie ones. We're watching these end of the world. TV shows, and one of them was these kids, they were captured in this building as I guess they were trying to find a cure for whatever was outside. Nobody knew it was outside the building, and these kids escaped from this government facility because the government's always evil in the end times. They escape the government facility. They go out what looks to be Chicago, and Chicago's falling apart. The buildings are down from the atomic warfare. You know what hit me the first time I saw that was that's, there's a lot of truth in that right there. As they come out of this government facility, now, I'm not saying there's a disease that killed them all off, but when they come out and they realize the world's not really inhabitable, that's what we're going to read about tonight. That's one of the reasons we're so intrigued by it, because this end of the day, there's truth behind it. So let's look at some scripture today as we evaluate and look at what's going to come in the end times. Go to verse number five, pick, where we just read. It says, under the angel, the angel took a censer and filled it with uh, the fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings, and an earthquake. And the seven angels, prepared them, uh, prepared, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. So the first four trumpet blasts will affect. We're going to learn that they're going to affect. It's different than the other uh, judgments. Is They're going to come down and affect the earth's ecosystem, the atmosphere, drastically altering living conditions on the planet. The later judgments will involve spiritual warfare that affects people directly 
But not all the trumpets will, uh, but it's interesting that they're not all going to be limited in their scope. The first four plagues will deal with one-third of the planet. The demonic torment of the fifth plague is limited to only five months. The deadly spiritual attack of the sixth trumpet affects one-third of the world's population. So we see that he has purposely limited these different judgments for what's about to come. Now, the limits placed in these judgments remind us that God is still exercising restraint in the early stages of the tribulation, allowing room for repentance and salvation even in the midst of wrath. He is still, in the time when he could pour more wrath down, he's still begging people to come back to him. There's the preparation. Number two, there's the rapid fire judgments. The rapid fire judgments. So we're going to look at the first, these first four trumpets straight out, real quickly. Verse uh, number, verse seven is the first trumpet blast, excuse me. It says, verse seven, first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt, and all the grass was burnt up. Now, you notice what happened. I'll ask about that verse. A third part of the trees, this is the entire earth, a third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the grass was burnt up. I want you to think about how that would affect the ecosystem when all the grass is gone. Think about farming. I mean, I've been to... uh, the desert of Los Angeles a couple of times. We up in that area and we went to visit the college or something like that. And we've driven through the mountains north of Los Angeles. Los Angeles is relatively beautiful. Then you go north. And we drove, we got to drive through mountains. My wife reminds me that the mountains in Poconos, they're just big hills. All right. They're not mountains. All right. We've been reminded of that. But I thought, man, I'm going to take her to California and I'm going to show her mountains. So we're driving through, by the way, she's comparing everything to the Rockies. It's just not fair. There's no comparison to the Rockies, all right? There's, there's, that's just a whole different world. But we're driving through the northern uh, area of Los Angeles, and we're getting to Los Angeles County, and we're looking at these mountains, and they're just desert. There's no grass anywhere. There's these what they call Joshua trees coming up, and it's just desert as far as you can see. And we're driving down there, and we pull into this beautiful campus they have down there, and we're looking around, and then we get back. We land back in Philadelphia, and my wife says something that I, I just, I chuckled at it. We get, we come out of the airport. She says, oh, look, trees. And she walks out. We're outside Philadelphia. She's like, look, trees, all three of them, right? You know, there's trees here. It's green. This is amazing, because it was so dead and boring. And I remember once, so could you ever live in Los Angeles? She goes, nothing lives here. Have you seen the grass? It's just, and then they've got the, um, what, I can't remember what they're called now, those, I'm sorry, tumbleweeds flowing through there, and the dust, and, and it was just, in fact, when we were there, more than one occasion, she gets a, a bloody nose because it's so dry there. She goes, I never thought I'd want to go back to humidity again. But I remember watching this as I thought about what would happen. Can you imagine when the entire world has no grass? I mean, just think about the animals that get their food from that. Sometimes we learn this truth. We don't think about all that is affected by this. The first trumpet will unleash a judgment targeting one-third of the earth's vegetation and all of its green grass. This will no doubt decimate crops and forests, filling the air with smoke and ash. I've watched friends of mine who are on vacation in the West driving home because they have video of the, the air filled with ash from the California fires, and they're over in Arizona. And what they're talking about, the the air filled as you've watched this, and you can see this happening. This judgment will indirectly affect food supplies, the global economy, and health on a massive scale. Consider what it will be like. We can consider that a little easier today with the shortages we experienced. How many of you ever thought you'd see people fighting in the grocery store over toilet paper? I'm serious. I'm just watching people fight and beat each other. I like to know what they're doing with the extra toilet paper because there's no way they use it all. I'm thinking one guy showed a picture. I can't believe he did this. He showed a picture of an entire closet full. I mean, like a deep closet full of toilet paper right in the middle of the quarantine. And I thought, dude, go to eBay. You're going to become a millionaire off your closet right there. I I can't imagine that. But yeah, I remember was um, the Rulies when they came back, they're in Brazil, they came back to America and she made a comment to us that was very interesting. She told my wife, she said, we went, I went grocery store, I went grocery, to the grocery store the other day, and I was ready to be back to America to see all the shelves stocked, and I walked in, and it looked like Brazil. So many things not stocked. Now, 
that small. Because if you really wait long enough, and we live in the Philadelphia area, you just go to one of the other 300 grocery stores around here and go find something. But you imagine when you go in and it's all gone. You see this on TV shows and stuff. This will happen. That's what it will look like, total disaster. Can you imagine? They're even saying, people say today, we have plenty of food in our country. We just have a struggle getting it to the grocery stores or stopping people from panicking and taking all of that. We look at this. And can you imagine how that will be even worse? Let's look at the second judgment, the second trumpet blast, verse 8. And the second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. The third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, if you notice this, that it goes in. These, this is, by the way, these are not figurative. It was like, kind of like blood. This is true. The water, a third of the water of the, of the oceans will turn to blood, which means all of the animals in them will die. And all of the ships floating on the blood will begin destroyed. So I want you to picture just, just get, you remember this, it wasn't that long ago, I don't remember all the details behind it, but it was on the news for a week or two weeks, one of the barges down, I want to say it was in Egypt area, in the strait they call it, the barge was going and somehow it may have had a problem and it turned sideways, and at first, I'm, I'm hearing it on the news, this barge sideways, and I'm like, and go around it, so... I had no idea how ignorant I was at that point. So I watched the news, and it literally blocked. You couldn't get around it either way. It's just one little straight that literally takes most of the trade for the entire world. And it was stuck. And they were afraid to push it because it would tip and knock over everything on it. And it would take months to clean this place up. So I want a couple weeks, no matter how long, it just sat there. And I'll never forget one of the things I heard. If someone was talking about the billions of dollars in, in damage done to the economy from this ship sitting there because of trade. Billions of dollars in, in effect, effect on the economy because it sat there. Because one ship couldn't get through and it blocked everything. Imagine when they can't get through any of them. What it will be like when the sea turns to blood the animals die, the ships can't go. Imagine what the safety and security in our world is going to be like when the world's navies realize they can't get to where they're supposed to get to. And our navy has lost effect in certain parts of securing the world because they can't get there. Those who depend on ocean life or food will suffer hunger and hardship at an unprecedented scale. The destruction of seafaring vessels would cause the disruption of a global trade. A crisis of security because the navies will not be able to get what they're supposed to. Let's look at the third trumpet blast in verse 10. And a third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, many believe like a meteorite, coming from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star was called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter." These waters will ultimately become contaminated, render poisonous to anybody who drinks it by this idea of the word wormwood or bitter. It's really what the word means, bitter. One third of the world's drinking water will become poisonous. This will ultimately bring death, but it will not be quick. Can you imagine watching a loved one die because of thirst or poison because they are so thirsty? This last weekend... Uh, my son, I, I heard about this all later. My son came home, I guess, my youngest son comes home from school, comes in and asks, Mom, are you washing your hands? Well, yes, stop. I'm like, what are they teaching you at that school? All right, we got to rethink this. And we did not know this. Apparently, there is a boiling alert in our area. I'd never heard of that in my life. I actually heard about it when Brother Bringhurst communicated to me. He was gracious enough. He brought us some water over. So today, I'm ready to make sweet tea because I'm out of sweet tea and we can't live without sweet tea. It's sustenance of life. You need bread, milk, sweet tea. That is sustenance of life. And so I, I'm filling it up with, I'm an idiot. I'm filling up the sink, this, the, this container with the water from the faucet. My wife goes, you can't use that. It's poisonous, we think. She didn't use the word poisonous. I'm making that part up, right? She can't use that. The water's probably nasty. So I grab the container I was given, and I'm pouring it over there, hoping not to spill it all over <laughs> the living. And you know what's amazing to me, though? We had 10 gallons of very fresh water in a house. It was wonderful. It was great. But I, I was thinking about this this afternoon. There will be a time where you turn that on. It may not look like it, but it'll kill you. And that's what's coming. That's part of what God is going to bring as judgment to the earth. The fourth trumpet blast, verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. 
the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Places in the area hit hardest by these plagues will already have lost power and deteriorated into desperation and despair. Add natural darkness to the situation, and the result will be anarchy and chaos. We've already seen that with the rioting recently. A couple months ago, well, end of June, we flew into Alaska. I'd never been to Alaska. I'll be honest with you, I can say this now fully transparent, all right? I wasn't really excited about going. I, the idea of the, you know, I, I'd be cold or the sun being up all the time, I didn't know what to expect. I'll be honest with you, I had a blast. One of the best trips I've ever taken. Uh, the pastor there, they were a great family. We just had a great time. I got to go up and touch an iceberg. I don't ever really need to do it again, but it was, you know, it was so funny. The pastor and I, we both walked up and touched it. We're both like, man, that's cold. It's a frozen piece of ice. But we were surprised that it was cold. I don't know what was wrong with us. But I remember we landed late due to delays into Anchorage. And so we landed about 1.30 in the morning, Anchorage time, which I think was 5.30 in the morning, our time. So we were tired. We're going down to the hotel we'd found, and I'm standing outside talking to the missionary. And, and I looked at him. I said, so, man, it looks like the sun... Is, is, is coming up. He goes, well, yeah, it only dark about two hours at night. So we were talking about, but it was never completely dark. It was like the sun on the horizon. You could see it, but it never went completely dark. So we got up the next day. It was bright. We take off down for, you know, Homer. We're in Homer, 11 o'clock at night. It's still that bright out. And I'm talking to the missionary, and I was like, man, this is crazy. He goes, you know, this morning or last night when you saw how dark it was, he goes, that's what it's like most of winter. And I immediately thought, I'm never coming in January. All right? He was saying, we're driving down these roads, and they're just curvy roads. He goes, you'll come around a turn, and there's a moose just standing there. Just standing there. Now, the reason is, is they don't like the snow, so they want hard ground, so they go up on the roads. He said, a, a car hits it. He said, sometime the moose dies, pretty much every time the car dies. Almost every time. He said, and here's the worst part. They block off all traffic until they can investigate what happened. I'm like, you hit a moose. What is there to investigate? I still haven't figured that one out yet. But in, uh, anyway, so we're driving down there. And so at nighttime, we're driving. Now, one time we're leaving Sunday night, leaving the missionary's house. And we're going back to the hotel. And we're driving around. And my wife goes, look, a moose. Now, she said, look, a moose. You know what I'm thinking? She, she saw one in the ditch. She wanted a picture of it. She's got a picture of it. Kind of. Anyway, we won't go further there, right? We got the picture of the moose walking away from us. Anyway, uh, she said, look, a moose. Now, I'm remembering the conversation I'd had with the missionary and the dead cars, and I'm driving their church van. So I immediately slam on the brakes, and everybody in the car, what? What? I'm like, what? Where's the moose? I'm looking for this thing trying to kill us in the middle of the road, and it's a sweet little moose eating on the side. And I'm like, what's wrong? I panicked. Now, he said the problem at nighttime is you can't see it. Because there's no lights on the road. And it's like that all the time. He said, it's not abnormal to hear people, their cars being totaled. So if you move to Alaska, you need moose insurance or something like that on your car. I don't know, something like that. Now, when I think about that, and he talked about I said, I asked him, I said, Pastor Gosselbaugh, what's it like in that darkness? He said, I, I, I get antsy. I'm, I'm a worker. I don't do well. I want to go to bed at 4 o'clock because it's, so, it's been dark for hours. He goes, we have about just a little bit of dim light between from about 11 to 2. He said, it's back. It's about 4 o'clock. I want to go to bed. He said, there's nights I go to bed at 5, 6 o'clock. The problem is at 3 in the morning, you wake up and you look up and guess what it is? Dark. He said, you turn your lights on all the time, but it doesn't make a difference. And they have a beautiful house. The entire back wall is light. He said, that wall is great, except in the winter, because all you're reminded of is dark. Now, the one thing that's awesome is the little dark you get, at least where we were, you could see some stars. I can't imagine what it was like out there to see the stars. But can you imagine that darkness and not being able to see the stars? I remember when we were in Peru, years ago, we were with a missionary Templeton, and he was saying, I was asking him, what are some of the struggles of living in that part of the world? And he said, you know, most missionaries don't make it in this part of Peru for one primary reason. He goes, look up, and it was overcast. It was their winter. I didn't think anything of it. He goes, it's overcast about 80% of the year. He said, you almost never see the sun. He goes, you get so depressed, you can't make it, you go home. And I thought, man, I would go crazy. He, and even in, in Alaska, Brother Grossomoff was telling us, he goes, by the time the sun starts coming back, the depression can build in if you're not careful. You really have to find ways to work through it. He goes, you're going to work at 8 in the morning, and it's still pitch black. Now, that's normal. That's part of the world. Can you imagine that all over everywhere? 
and the depression that would come in, adding to the fact that we can't eat and all those things, the anarchy will be crazy. Imagine world governments attempting to bring help, but will have little recourse because so much of the natural resources have been destroyed. Then I want to look just last second at verse 13, the warning of what is to come. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Think about this. If just what, what just happened wasn't bad enough, an angel flies warning that the worst is yet to come. Now, I'm going to finish with the same thought I started with in this. Most of us look at this, and it's intriguing. You know why we find it intriguing? Because we want to see how maybe the world history, and like we're talking about storms and all these things happening, how it's all going to work to make this make sense. And by the way, someone's going to have to explain away all of these things, that it's not God. So obviously, as the world's beginning to see more drastic in its weather, it may not be, but it would make sense. I'm not predicting, but it would make sense that if the weather patterns continue to get excessive, it, then it won't be surprising in the tribulation. They'll go back over the last 10 years and talk about these natural disasters. So it wouldn't be abnormal to think about the things we're seeing building up towards that. And that still may be, you know, 30 years, 100 years away. We don't know when God's coming back. But it's easy for us not to think much of this in a scary way because we're not going to be here. Can I encourage us, though? If we are the generation that God takes home, if we are that generation that's been prophesied since the Bible was written, if we are that generation that God promised, number one, that would be totally awesome, just to be honest with you, okay? But the responsibility to be the last generation that God puts down here before he takes everyone home, before he brings this wrath. Yeah, that means it's going to be a little harder. Have you noticed it's a little harder to witness? A little harder to talk about Jesus? But yet, you know, maybe, just maybe, God's made it a little easier in the last, couple, last year and a half. See, how in the world, how many of you have met people just a little more frightened, a little more discouraged, a little more easily irritated because of everything going on right now, screaming for hope? Hope's not found in government. It's not found in anything else but Jesus. I'm not saying go preach on the streets and look crazy. I'm saying what a chance to offer something that the world cannot offer to them. It just may be that. And God may open up an opportunity for us. And I'm not, you know, look for it. Look what God does. What opportunities he give us. Because this is coming. What we're reading is coming. We know it is. Now, we're not going to be there for it. Praise the Lord. I don't know how much of it we'll see. What I do know, it's coming. And boy, may we get a heart for those that are here. Because at some point, our world will go through everything we've heard tonight. And worse, as we've noticed. Father, we love you.